Now, let's look at the missile men who will operate, maintain, and support your Atlas squadron. How are they different from other airmen? The answer is, they aren't. They're the same alert, trainable young men who can make this B-52 capable of delivering its payload to an enemy target. Today, they're learning what they must know, to send a ballistic missile off its launcher and into its planned trajectory. This is Major David Gardner, 34 years old, a launch control officer. His training began nearly two years ago in this classroom at Convair Astronautics, San Diego. Staff Sergeant James Graham, a former bomb nav systems technician at March Air Force Base, also received his missile systems analyst training at Convair. Airman First Class Ted Baker, radio tracking system specialist. His classroom? a laboratory somewhere on the east. And Airman First Class Paul Kincaid, electronic data maintenance technician. He studied in the factory alongside engineers who themselves were still learning. As fast as training equipment and instructors become available, individual specialist courses are transferred to Air Force schools where the student learns the skills necessary to perform his role as a member of a missile team. Operational readiness training is conducted at Vandenberg Air Force Base, hub of the Pacific Missile Range. Here, these specialists meet for the first time to combine their skills and perform as a missile team. Here, the individual training of the operational maintenance and support personnel is put to the test. Here, they are required to perform in precise sequence all operations from the birth of the missile to its death somewhere high above the Pacific test range. T minus 15. The operations crew takes over at this moment inside the launch operations building. The launch control officer is now commander of the missile. His cockpit, this underground room. His controls, this electronic console through which he governs the countdown sequence. Another training launch has begun. As the operation progresses, the men within the launch control center know they are being observed, that every move they make is being carefully noted by skilled SAC instructors. These same standardization teams from SAC will later inspect the crews of the operational squadrons, simulating alert conditions and monitoring personnel performance. Or there may be little opportunity to check individual responsibilities once this serious game is being played in earnest. It's a matter of seconds now. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. A flawless countdown. A perfect firing. To every man who participated, Today's successful launch means one thing, graduation. But training for the missile man never really ends. Twice each year, crews return to their alma mater, to Vandenberg, for combat training launches. Under the unit proficiency training system, a part of the missile inventory is annually launched in order to keep these crews combat ready. Missile men are also kept up to date in the field of safety. given startling visual proof of the countless dangers inherent with the ballistic missile. For with missiles, these men deal constantly with tremendous pressures, with sub-zero cold, with a variety of deadly hazards common only to this type of weapon system. For this reason, safety cannot be overemphasized at the test site or at the operational squadron, where every commander must continue the training with active safety campaigns. Identified separately from other squadron personnel are the indirect missile support groups. Like the bomber squadron, we still find the essential supply people, communications personnel, the air policemen, cooks, and the administrative personnel. These also are missile men, working behind the scenes, you might say, 
to back up SAC's operational personnel. Now let's suppose, Colonel, that 14 months have passed since that day you first entered this missile business. As we promised, you now have the missiles, the men, and the ground support equipment a fully operational squadron. And let's suppose that this is not just like any ordinary day, but a day the free world prayed would never come. The first day of a nuclear war. You know where it begins, that initial warning, that terrible moment of realization that an enemy attack is imminent. For a crew of radar specialists, it begins in this isolated tracking station somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. For Airman Second Class Jerry Williams, it begins behind this transparent intelligence map at the North American Air Defense Command Center at Colorado Springs. For SAC's Commander-in-Chief and his staff, it begins in the heart of Nebraska's farm country in a building unlike any other building in the world. We are now 45 feet beneath the surface of the Earth. This is SAC's underground command post, a bomb-proof, radiation-proof, communication and trajectory center. From here, the global activities of the Strategic Air Command are about to be directed. Repeat, this is a yellow alert. NORAD reports 80 unidentified targets. 20 are in Sector Romeo 4 on a southeasterly heading. Range 320. 12 are in Sector Romeo 5. This is Igloo. I'm tracking a large unidentified flying force on a penetration course at 30,000 feet. Angel, snow cap tracking. Come in, snow cap. Snow cap to angels. Unidentified, still on course. Estimated time of arrival upon a penetration, 14 hours, Zulu. This is the Air Force Command Post. Authentication is independence. Prepare to copy Joint Chiefs of Staff emergency message 3 Alpha. As I call your command, acknowledge presence. This is back to command post. NORAD reports positive penetration through sectors Sierra 2, November 6, and Romeo 4. All SAC forces now in condition red. Repeat, condition red. SAC's mixed force goes into operation. Rabbit, this is Big Boy. The launch enabling switch is in the off position. Report the condition of all missiles on your command. Roger, Big Boy. This is Jack Rabbit. Test complete and holding on missile Alpha at T minus one seven zero. Hold on missile Coco at T minus five two one. Missile Bravo counting at T minus nine zero eight. Jack Rabbit, out. Uh, Roger, LCO. Proceed with the EWP Red. Looks like this is the real thing, LCO. Good luck, Jack Rabbit. Big boys out. is going to be a big part of your world soon. The world of the ballistic missile. Perhaps in this brief look into your tomorrow, you found some of the answers you've been looking for. 
but there will be other questions and other answers as Atlas enters each new operational phase. Improvements both in missile technology and site configuration are in the mill now. Improvements, for example, like the mobile Apche checkout units, offering great reductions in manpower as they take over from today's fixed equipment. But probably the most important changes involve the missile sites themselves. Gradually, today's soft coffin-type launch and service buildings will be replaced by hardened facilities. Probably 25 PSI at first then 50, and finally, the ultimate. Widely scattered 100 PSI launch emplacements with a salvo launch capability. And other men like you are going to have to face up to even more sophisticated missile systems. SAC's ICBM inventory is expanding. On the horizon are refined weapons like Titan, shown here during its final testing phase. And solid fuel missiles like Minuteman capable of striking assigned targets from scores of underground silo emplacements, as well as from roving railway cars. But whatever the type, whatever the operational environment, the biggest challenge is to understand and accept the ICBM concept. Once you become missile conscious, become a missile man in every sense of the word, the transition from one missile system to another won't be hard. It's the first big transition that's the hardest. It's the one that calls for the most versatile kind of leadership.